The city of Konya in Turkey is a city that almost no foreign tourists from Europe or America go to. It is 9,000 years old and is the most religious city of modern Turkey. Today, a walk from this mysterious city, numbering more than 2 million people. Konya is a city in Turkey that is not very spoiled by the attention of tourists. And I must say that it is very in vain. We got to Konya during our autumn trip to Turkey. After spending a few days in my beloved Istanbul, and then in Antalya, we planned to go to Cappadocia, but at first there was an idea to visit another of the regions of Turkey. The choice was between Ephesus, Pamukkale, as well as the oldest and most religious city in Turkey, Konya. And I am very glad that we chose the latter option. By the way, the release from Pamukkale is already on my channel. And the issue from Cappadocia will be on it soon, don't miss it. <laughs> Konya is one of the most ancient cities in the world. To the south of Konya is the settlement of Chattel Hyuk, it is also Chattel Gayak or Chattel Hoyuk. This settlement led its history from 7500 BC, that is, 9000 years ago, life was already in full swing here. And 4000 years ago, the city already under the name Kuvana was part of the Hittite kingdom. In Greek documents, one can find information about Konya, which appears in them as Iconion or Iconius. This city is also mentioned in the Bible. The Apostle Paul preached here. Under the Roman Emperor Claudius, the city already bears the name Claudiconium. And in the 11th century, the Konya region was part of the Seljuk state and was referred to as the Iconian Sultanate. It was then that the famous mathematician and poet Omar Khayyam lived here. Konya is the most religious city in Turkey to be honest. I don't know how Konya got this title. Nevertheless, you can often hear that Konya is the most religious city in Turkey. And some details really confirm this. For example, if you are a young man or a man and you are traveling with a girl, but you are not married, then booking accommodation in Konya may not be the easiest thing to do, as most hotels in Konya will require a marriage certificate when settling in one room. That is, they can only accommodate couples who are officially married in one room. This, by the way, is indicated on the pages of hotels on booking. But don't worry. You can also find a hotel that does not ask for a certificate. It is also very difficult to find alcohol in Konya. There are no shops that sell them here. It can only be found in the bars of expensive hotels intended for Europeans. Well, here is such a brief sketch about the city. I suggest you get on the road. The city center is a unique Seljuk architecture. Most of the sites of Konya belong to the Seljuk era or are associated with the Sufism movement. These are old mosques and madrasas. Unfortunately, now Konya has lost all its once numerous defensive structures. Neither the outer walls nor the walls of the citadel remain. It is interesting that European travelers saw the fortress walls of Konya almost in full in the 19th century. Several drawings of the Seljuk fortification have been preserved. But then all the walls magically disappeared, and in a short time, by the beginning of the 20th century, almost nothing remained. The hill of the Konya citadel at the end of the 19th century was a powerful structure. So, for example, there is a lonely standing tower in front of the mosque. This is all that remains of the palace of the Seljuk sultans. Of course, the city was subjected to earthquakes, which destroyed a lot, 
but it should be noted that there have always been earthquakes in Asia Minor. The only conclusion that follows from this is that the Turks themselves destroyed all the fortifications and the remains of other medieval buildings. An interesting paradox appears here. The Turks completely destroyed their own heritage, destroying Konya, their old capital in Asia Minor, but preserved, for example, the Byzantine walls of Constantinople. It is worth noting that the walls of the citadel in Konya, located on a hill, did not interfere with anyone, and now there is no building there, just a city park remains. Why they did this is unclear. But for now we are walking along the streets of the old city, where, among other things, the old shopping malls are represented. This is the Mevlana Bazaar. So we have already come to one iconic Muslim building. Azizi Mosque in Kone is the most beautiful and unusual that I have ever seen. Turkey never ceases to amaze. This mosque was built by Kara Mustafa Pasha in 1676 under Sultan Mehmed IV. It was a time when the Ottoman Empire was still at the zenith of its glory and still posed a serious threat to European states. Azizia Mosque acquired its modern look at the end of the 19th century, when it was badly damaged by fire and was restored in 1891. If you are in Konya, be sure to try to see this work of art with your own eyes. You can find it near the Mevlana Bazaar in one of the busiest areas of the city. Even a couple of hundred meters from the mosque, when you see its minarets, you begin to admire and admire the inexpressible beauty of Azizia. Azizi Mosque began to be built in 1671 by order of Mustafa Pasha. The construction was completed five years later, in 1676. Two centuries later, in 1867, as a result of a strong fire, Azizia suffered a lot. In fact, it was almost rebuilt a little later, as I said earlier. During the restoration, Azizia received clear features of the Ottoman Baroque, which fascinate visiting architecture lovers. Other distinctive features of the mosque are huge windows starting right from the floor, as well as very massive doors. The mosque acquires special beauty with the onset of the evening, when the illumination of its walls and minarets is turned on. If you have a choice, then I recommend visiting the Azizi Mosque in the evening during the Azan, so you will get even more pleasant impressions from your stay in Konya. The mosque is made of chiseled stone and decorated with huge windows stretching almost the entire height of the building. But its most attractive element is the two minarets, decorated with figured reliefs. I really like the mosque, it is beautiful from the outside, and the interior decoration is impressive. Located in the center, easy to visit. Ну, такой исторической архитектуры здесь поболее, чем э, в каком-нибудь Самсуне на, на севере Турции. Что, круче Анкары тоже? Анкара, да плюс-минус такая же. Ну, там мечети есть, но Анкара стала развиваться лишь в последние сто лет, когда стала столицей при Кемале и Тюрке. До этого -то вся власть сидела в Стамбуле, то есть Анкара, по сути, не имеет вот таких вот масштабов. Они остановились масштабных э, старых мечетей. Well, then we pass through new shopping arcades, where in the near future new souvenir products for pilgrims coming by horse will be sold. New houses have been built relatively recently. Before that, back in 2015, there were echoes of a traditional market and some poor quarters at this place. Thanks to the renovation of the territories, in Konya, close to important tourist sites, the space is being improved and new houses are being built. Крестение в принципе, как сам можно начать снимать. У нас там стадион просто...
But now we are getting closer to the iconic place in Konya. This is a mosque. Selamie Mosque. Selam II Mosque. In other words, it is a 16th century Ottoman mosque. The mosque is located in the municipality of Karate. It is located in the business center of the city to the east of the Azizi Mosque. The mosque was built next to the burial complex of Mevlana Celaluddin Rumi, a Persian Sufi mystic originally from the 13th century. Today, Next to the mosque is the Mevlana Museum. History of the mosque. The mosque was built in 1558 by Selim II, when he was still a prince, working as a governor of the Sanjak. Although the mosque was built when Mimar Sinan served as chief architect, the building is not mentioned in any of his autobiographies. In Konya, Sinan lists only the reconstruction of the hospice. Construction was completed in 1570 after Selim became Sultan. She was later refurbished three times. In 1685, in 1816 and back in 1914. <laughs> Mosque architecture the mosque with two minarets is a typical 16th century Ottoman mosque and resembles the Fadi Mosque in Istanbul. The prayer area is covered with a large dome. Above the portico are seven small domes. The mirab is made of blue marble and the minbar is made of white marble. Near Mevlana Square in Konya is the Mevlana Museum. This is a museum that has been operating since 1926 in the complex that used to be the Durga of Mevlana. It is also called Mausoleum of Malana. April 6, 1926 the Melis of Turkey signed a decree on the creation of a museum on the basis of the complex of structures of the tomb of Jalaladin Rui and the Teke of Sufi dervishes. The museum was opened on March 2, 1927, and in 1954 it received its modern name, the Mevlana Museum, the Green Dome, that is, the Mausoleum of Mevlana, is built on four thick columns. Since then, the architectural complex has expanded, and various additions have been made here on different dates. The fact that some of the Ottoman sultans belonged to the Mevlevi order gave the mausoleum a special significance and ensured its good preservation. What does all this mean? This is the direct history of Asia Minor. Once upon a time, Sultan Allah ad-Din K. Kubid I, who invited Jalaladin Rumi to Konya, offered him to provide his rose garden for the burial of Rumi's father, Ba ad-Din Walad, who died on January 12, 1231, after the death of Jalaladin Rumi himself, nicknamed Mevlana, which is translated from Farsi, our Lord, December 17, in 1273 he was buried next to his father. Mevlana's successor, Husamet in Celebi, erected a mausoleum over Rumi's grave. The construction of the mausoleum, designed by the architect Baretin Tabrizli, was completed in 1274. The construction of the mausoleum was financed by the Georgian princess Gurju Khatun, who became the wife of Amir Suleiman al-Din Pervin and Amir Alamadine Kaiser. A distinctive feature of the tomb of Mevlana was the dome covered with turquoise faience tiles. Yes, I understand that you have some difficulties with understanding the history of these places. You know, a foreigner will also not immediately understand the Russian principalities, and why the Prince of Novgorod was once a prince and a prince of Kiev and united the swamps of the northwest, and today they are completely different states with one common culture. History is a thing in which everything is mixed in layers so that it is very difficult to understand at once.
Чар, наверное, был очарован. А? Чар, наверное, был очарован вот, это, вот этим районом. И поэтому... Она узкая. This Sufi Tarakat. That is, the method of spiritual elevation and mystical knowledge of the truth, founded in the 13th century in the Seljuk Sultanate of Konya. It is based on the teachings and cult of the Persian poet and mystic Malan Jalal ad-Din Rumi. The Meblevi emphasizes music, singing and dancing during worship and collective dicker, hence it is known as the Brotherhood of Whirling Dervishes. Руку, 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 руку. Dervish practice. Mevlevi rites are a complex ritual. It consists of the recitation of a verse in praise of the Prophet Muhammad, musical improvisations and the performance of a spinning dance, followed by the second part of four musical and dance sections called Salam which conclude with instrumental music and recitation of the core and along with the creation of prayers. Dervishes appear in white oblong felt hats of Central Asian origin, and with black capes. These capes are thrown off during the dance, and the dervishes appear in white robes. This change of clothes is interpreted as death and resurrection. During rotation, the dervish holds his right hand turned to the sky, and his left hand to the earth. The movements are slow and majestic at first, with a gradual acceleration to the beat of the music, but they never become out of control. The dervishes spin separately, without touching each other with their shoulders, each around its own axis and around the sheikh and other dervishes. They do not utter a sound, do not make any movements with their hands or head. Mevlevi novices undergo years of self-denial and sama training, the Biktashi, another 13th century Sufi order derided the Mevlevi dance as an unnecessary adjunct to the worship of God. Rumi believed that the spirit is freed from the weight of the flesh in the process of Sama and the exaltation of human existence as feelings and thoughts can only be achieved by mastery in Sama. The correct Sama can only be performed with the permission and presence of the Sheikh. The dervishes responsible for performing the ritual cover the floor in the Simakon with sheepskins, symbolizing the right of the Sheikh. Dressed in white robes with wide skirts called tenor and high hats made of felt, the dervishes offer their prayers after they receive a sign in the form of the appearance of a sheikh in a green headdress. After reading from the Mesnevi and the Koran, one of the dervishes begins to play the Ney, an ancient reed flute. I think you present this complex picture. Well, now you understand that the dervishes and their order come from Konya. The center of the Mevlevi is the mausoleum of Rumi in the city of Konya. The creator of Mevlevi was the son of Rumi Sultan Veld, who lived at the beginning of the 14th century, who wrote the works, Rubab Nama, that is, the Book of Rubab, and Ishik Nama, in other words, translated, the Book of Love, about love mysticism to God, which formed the basis of the teachings. Adepts of the Mevlevi wore a tall conical cap, a white sleeveless shirt, a wide belt and a loose black cape. Food was obtained by labor. Calligraphy occupied a special place in the Mevlevi. The first followers of the Mevlevi came from the middle and lower urban strata, but already at the end of the 14th century, from the elite of the Ottoman Empire, including the sultans. With the Ottoman conquests, Merida spread to Asia Minor, Transcaucasia and the Middle East. By the decree of Ataturk on September 4, 1925, the Brotherhood was dissolved, its property was confiscated. Mevlevi activities in Turkey were only later allowed only in 1954.
Well, we continue our walk. And now we are walking along Meblana Kadesi, that is, Meblana Street towards the hill of Ala Ad Din. While we are walking along the main street of the city, on the opposite side is an old historical mansion. Now the General Assembly of the Special Administration of Konya Province is located in this place. General Assembly of the Special Administration of the Province of Konya, which operates in the field of public administration. But let us talk about the history of the formation and milestones of the city through which the city moved so slowly to its current state. Pre-Greek period. The place itself has been inhabited for a very long time. 50 kilometers south of the city is the Chattel Huyuk settlement, whose history can be traced back to the 8th millennium BC. Under the name Kuvana, the city was part of the Hittite kingdom about 4,000 years ago. It was also called in Phrygia. Roman and Byzantine period. In Greek documents, the city appears as Iconion. In the Bible, Iconion is mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, and the trips of the Apostle Paul are associated with the city. It is considered the birthplace of the first martyr Theocla. This is the 30s of the 1st century, the great martyr Periskova Pyotnitsa, the 3rd century. During the time of the Roman Emperor Claudius, the city was handed over to the veterans and received the name, Claudiconium. The city belonged to the Roman province of Lycaonia. In Greek times the city belonged to Phrygia. Archaeological excavations in the city center have yielded Phrygian wares from about the 25th year of our era, as well as objects characteristic of the neighboring provinces of Galatia, Cappadocia, Pisidia and Pamphylia. As can be seen from the imperial coins, Iconium had the rights of a Roman colony. Iconium is especially often mentioned in the era of the Crusades. Seljuks was occupied by the Seljuks in 1070. The power of the Seljuk state gradually weakened. While Iconium was the capital, the state was called the Iconian Sultanate, and the name Konya appeared after a couple of centuries. At that time, Konya was an active center for both Turkish and Persian culture. Omar Khayyam lived here. This was the 12th century. In the 13th century, Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, who formed the Sufi order, lived and was buried here. Mevlevi, his mausoleum is still considered a holy place, and pilgrims constantly visit Konya. On holidays, dervishes arrange a Sima ritual at his grave. After the Mongol conquest of Anatolia in early 1240, Konya remained the center of Sufism, and dervish orders like the Mevlevi were organized throughout the east. As for the Seljuk state, it broke up into several beyliks at the beginning of the first half of the 14th century. In 1322, the former capital of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum was conquered by the Karamanids and was their capital until 1420. Ottoman Empire, in 1553, in the town of Erigli near Konya, Shazad Mustafa was executed, and in 1559, the future Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Selim II, defeated his brother, Shazad Bayezid, in battle, the 21st of December in 1832, a decisive battle took place here between the Egyptian army of Ibrahim Pasha and the Ottoman army of Grand Vizier Mehmed Reshid Pasha. 
Despite the significant superiority of the Ottoman forces, they suffered a complete defeat and Mehmed Reshid Pasha himself, seriously wounded, was taken prisoner. In Ottoman times, Konya was also a center for dervishes and a holy city where numerous pilgrims gathered. Today, the city regularly holds annual dervish festivals in mid-December, accompanied by dances. The festivals are more secular than religious in nature. Before us is the hill of Ala Ad Din. This is a small hill in the center of the Turkish city of Konya. The hill is 20 meters high above the surrounding landscape. The hill of Ala Ad Din is the oldest place of human settlement in the territory of Konya. As a result of excavations carried out in 1941, it was possible to establish that the first settlements on the hill arose in the era of the Early Bronze Age, approximately 3,000 years BC. In 1908, by order of Konya Farid Pasha, a water tank and a fountain were built on the hill. In 1936, a front staircase was built to climb the hill, at the top of which there is a monument to the memory of the martyrs, from which a view of the Mevlana Museum opens. Of Phrygian, Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine and Seljuk cultures preserved on the hill, today, the hill of Ala Ad Din is a monument of history and culture, as well as one of the main attractions of the city of Konya. From the history of this hill, it is authentically known that the first settlements on the hill of Ala Ad Din arose in 3000 BC. After the collapse of the Hittite kingdom, the territory of central Anatolia in about 1190 BC is in the power of the Phrygians. The hill and the city that was formed on it at that time received the name Kuvana. After the Phrygians, the time comes for the Lydians, whose kingdom fell in 547 BC, conquered by the Persian king Cyrus II. Kuvana is part of the Satrapy Cappadocia. In the Hellenistic period, the name of the city changes to Iconion. During the Byzantine era, Iconion became the administrative center of the region of central Anatolia. At this time, urban construction was already carried out outside the surrounding hill walls. At the end of the 11th century Iconion becomes the capital of the Anatolian Seljuk Empire. The Seljuks give the city the modern name of Konya, and the empire is referred to accordingly as the Konya Sultanate. In 1190 during the Third Crusade Frederick I Barbarossa captures Konya and places a garrison there, but soon the Seljuks recapture the city back. During the reign of Sultan Masud I, the Byzantine basilica on the hill begins to be rebuilt into a mosque which becomes the Sultan's tomb, and the Sultan's palace is being built by Sultan Kilik Arslan II. Somewhat later, the hill receives a name in honor of Sultan Ala ad-Din K. Kubid I, under which the Seljuk Empire reaches its greatest prosperity. Такие горы, посмотри, они тут всюду. Голые. Earlier, we already passed the walls of the Ala Ad Din Mosque, the oldest architectural landmark of Kony and the mosque is the tomb of the Seljuk Sultans. The walls and the mosque itself were built at the beginning of the 13th century. After the capture of Konya by the Seljuks in 1080, many Byzantine religious buildings were gradually rebuilt into mosques. At the heart of the Ala Ad Din Mosque is also a Byzantine basilica. The first reconstructions began in 1150 during the reign of Sultan Masud I. The ebony minbar, made in 1155, belongs to the same period and is the oldest example of Seljuk art in Anatolia. 
By the same time belong tiled mirab and central dome. Large-scale work on the reconstruction and expansion of the mosque began in 1219 under Sultan K. Kabuz I. With him, a monumental facade is created on the north side, overlooking the city and the palace of the sultans. At the same time, the marble tomb of the sultans began to be erected. However, the death of K. Kabuz interrupted these works. They were resumed already under his brother and successor Sultan Allah ad-Din K. Kubid I. By order of Allah ad-Din, 42 columns were installed in the main hall of the mosque in 1235. After that, for more than six and a half centuries, the mosque remained virtually unchanged. Only in 1891 was a minaret erected and a new marble mirab created. I must say that from the hill there is a perspective view of the whole city. You can even see where it ends. And the mountains surrounding the city are visible, empty, without vegetation, large hills, whose height above sea level is about 1,200 meters. Well, then we will walk along the hill and then we will go down towards a kind of city building. City tram in Konya. We go to Ataturk Street, where the city tram runs. Today Konya tram is a modern tram system that has been in operation since 1992, along with the Istanbul tram, which appeared in the same year, it is the oldest tram system in Turkey among those in operation. Construction of a tram in Konya began in 1986. The first line was put into operation in 1992. Initially, used trams of German origin from Cologne operated in Konya. Trams were articulated, three section. The first trams were purchased in 1989. Later trams were purchased in 1995 and 1996. The last batch of former Cologne trams arrived in Konya in October 2004. In total, 61 trams from Cologne operated in Konya. In 2013, an order was placed for 60 Škoda low-floor trams originally from the Czech Republic. The contract price was 104 million euros. It is these trams that are currently operating on the lines. But let us turn into a residential development in the center of Konya. I am sure that such an atmospheric walk through the streets will leave great traces in your memory. As you understand, today the city of Konya cannot be called a tourist center for Europeans. This is more of a pilgrimage story for Muslims. Yet, when there are such places as Antalya, Istanbul, the same seaside side, Kemmer, Bodrum and others, it is not at all easy to enter this pantheon. However, Turkey continues to develop tourism, and does it not only in seaside cities. Big country, big opportunities and the Turks understand this. <laughs> Вот эти улицы очень улицы Стамбула напоминают. Я тебе говорю, жилые районы вот эти очень сильно стамбульские улицы напоминают. И центральные, и не центральные. 
Local tourism is firmly on its feet. We can say that this is the foundation, and then, brick by brick, the Turks expand it. Konya, like any other Turkish city, can boast of its numerous museums, which contain unique artifacts found during excavations, or carefully preserved exhibits that have been passed down from generation to generation. Of course, here in the city there are much more closed girls and women than, for example, in Ankara and Izmir. But at the same time, I saw these closed girls in an embrace or by the hand walking with their boyfriends. That is, not everything is so clear. I once heard from a Russian girl who came to Konya for a short visit the story that in Konya those who received her told her to go only in a long skirt. <laughs> Вот смотри. Давай спросим. Мараба. О, сейчас, сейчас нас похитит. Сейчас нас похитит. Вот смотри, какие волка-то. Кто там в самом начале ты сказал? Нас много. Да мы идем до авто. Успокойся. Сейчас на парковку выйдем. Вы же там припарковались, не я? Стоять, всем стоять. Заряжать. Обвес вот эта вся тема. Это и в Анталии у них нормально. Да. Мы прошлись просто самым кратчайшим путем до парковки. Да, да. Я вот по этой крыше напал. It made me laugh. Here the girls go in skirts, and even above the knees, and in trousers, and off the shoulder blouses, young girls in shorts. Yes, I haven't seen anyone here in mini skirts yet, but everyone dresses quite normally. Of course, the vast majority of the female population dress modestly, probably trying not to attract attention, but if someone wears a skirt above the knees, no one will throw a stone at her. Although I noticed that the male population here is somewhat more active in showing interest in the female population. That is, they can stare openly and without embarrassment, but at the same time, no words should be addressed to the girls. They just look. And it is hardly because of the clothes. So here she is Konya. Many-sided, religious, ancient, and not a bit boring. Come to the city and explore it. About alcohol. If you want to drink in any Reiki restaurant in Konya, you will have to work hard to find such a restaurant. I know one of these, in the Maram area. Beer can be drunk in those few cafes where it is sold, but it will be only indoors, and certainly not on the street. At first I thought that the people of Konya do not drink alcohol at all. But in fact, they drink beer only at home, without advertising it. For many men, I see wedding rings here not on the left hand, as is customary in Turkey, but on the right. It is also believed here that a man should wear a ring made of white metal, not yellow. In general, I notice that the people here are very friendly. No one here has said or done anything bad to me. Wherever we went, we never encountered rudeness or anything like that. As I have already said, most visitors from other cities living in Konya are more likely to dislike this city. And do you know why? There are many reasons, everyone has their own. But mainly because there is nothing to do here. Social life is almost zero. People spend their free time visiting each other, shopping malls or picnics, that s all. During our stay in Konya, we explored the main historical sites and surroundings. Not every resident of Konya, according to my observations, has at least a part of the knowledge about their hometown that a tourist immersed in guidebooks can emphasize. 
thank God our stay in this interesting and at the same time unusual kingdom has come to an end. My story about Konya is almost over and my mission called, Konya, is completed. Почему они закрывают волос? Это страсть к волосам, что ли? If you are interested in walking with us, then be sure to subscribe to the channel, put your ratings, leave comments and somehow prove yourself under the video. Well, we are finishing our walk. And in the finale, I will leave you pieces of the video that were filmed during our movement around the city by car. Perhaps they will show the outskirts of the city from the other side, or show the scale of this settlement.
this is where we will end the story, and round off in our video. Well, if you have matured comments, then write them under the video. With this we will say goodbye. Be sure to rate this video, recommend it to your friends and send it to each other. And we will definitely see you in new releases about Turkey, Georgia, Russia, Belarus and other countries on the channel soon. Be sure to subscribe and rate. See you. I've been rate.